So, welcome to, to talking about selling Agile a bit. This is a kind of an experimental session. I try to warn people this is a, a beta version of, of, of things, and uh, things are likely to go wrong, so never mind. A lot of interesting information still. So hey, uh, my name is Vesa Palmo. I'm the CEO of, of, of Wundercrowd. Um, I also have a couple of additional hats. I'm also a director at the Drupal Association, so I'm quite involved in all of this Drupal and related stuff. Um, I've been doing, doing uh, IT and web projects for quite a while. Um, I've been selling Agile for 10-ish years, um, and uh, I've been failing to do so quite a bit, and uh, also succeeding from time to time. So I'm, I'm here to share you some of my lessons learned uh, around, around uh, this journey. We have quite a lot of stuff to cover for today. Uh, I don't think we'll, we'll manage to cover all of it because I'm, I'm trying to take questions from you guys during this, but we'll see how far we get. So a uh, couple of words about Wundercrowd. If some of you were at the keynote this morning, you may have heard <laughs> something about Wundercrowd. Um, we are a uh, large-ish company that does Drupal, but we, our main job is really improving the business of our customers using online tools. Uh, we are one of the largest Drupal shops, if you will, in the world, uh, in nine different countries, and we are quite international. We have uh, 17 native languages spoken and quite a few nationalities and so on. Enough about us. So the format today, uh, I will have some guests. Uh, some of them are only recorded, so I did interviews for this because I didn't want to only show my point of view. I wanted to share also the customer point of view and a professional buyer uh, uh, point of view. So I have guys that I have short video interview clips here. Then I have, uh, do you want to introduce yourself? Yeah. Uh, so my name is Dick Olson. I currently work for Pfizer, uh, one of the world's biggest pharmaceutical companies. I am a senior manager in digital engineering. So I manage a lot of internal engineering pro projects all related to Drupal at Pfizer. And uh, he will be mostly answering your questions here if you want to ask something about like how does the customer see, see this thing. I also have my colleague Heike there in the end just helping me to take questions because I decided I'm going to use Twitter to take your questions because it, otherwise it may be impossible. So I'll get you on hashtag selling agile and uh, we'll start uh, getting some questions in very soon. But let's get started with the show by... Uh, how do vendors sell Agile? Uh, this is Berto Tolvanen. Uh, he's a uh, CMS, and, uh, CMS expert buyer, if you will. So what he does for a living is writes RFPs for different companies, chooses vendors, runs the RFP process, and so on. Uh, so his views on, on like how do you choose vendors I think are quite valuable. So let's see if I get the video thing working. I think selling Agile... Uh is a really actually dangerous style of selling the projects. We see it a lot, like too much. And I think many agencies should more focus to the benefits of what the Agile method offers for the client. In many situations when I'm on client side, I see that the, when the client says that they want Agile project, what they actually want, they want just visibility for the project and they want a really structured and easy change control mechanism. And that's the two things what the clients are actually expecting and that's what the agencies should convince the client that they have this kind of visibility, visible process and a lot of uh, change control possibilities. And the Agile should be a secondary thing in their pitch. To, to repeat the key message, because I don't think we can crank up, crank up the volume more unless we get somebody from the technical staff here. So basically he said, uh, don't sell Agile at all, sell the benefits of Agile, which I think is right on the money. That's what you really should do, and, and that's one of the, the key focus points in here. So three things really for today. Uh, first of all, Agile is, as such, it's not difficult to sell. Everybody wants to buy Agile, but it is still difficult to sell real Agile. So that's going to be the first topic. Then I have a couple of case studies, situations that you will run into when you are trying to sell Agile projects to your customers, stuff that happens in real life. And I'll, I'll examine a bit like each one of them, like how to deal with these situations. And in the end, it's not always appropriate to sell Agile. 
and, and there's not only like one way of selling Agile or one flavor of Agile, if you will. So I'll cover that as, uh, just a bit as well. So first of all, uh, I would like to hear from the audience. So now it's, now it's okay to twiddle all of these things. Uh, I would like to hear like how large percentage of, of, of your projects are Agile or what you would consider Agile. So if you could tweet this and use the hashtag uh, selling Agile, uh, we will get some statistics by the end of the session on this. So please do uh, tweet it. Also the same hashtag selling Agile we will use for all the questions. So if you have any question, feel free to tweet it. And uh, Heikki will, will choose some of the, the most interesting ones and, and bring them up to my attention. So, uh, first of all, why is Agile, like real Agile, difficult to sell? Well, really, it, it really comes down to trust. Uh, it's really a lack of trust that is like built into the relationship between customer and vendor like way too often. Uh, the customer thinks you are there to steal their money. The vendor thinks that the customer is just trying to get free work in the end. So that's the, that's the core, uh, core thing. But still, you know, uh, I haven't really had any real problems selling Agile as such. And, and I had a discussion around uh, this topic in, in a global scrum gathering a week ago with, with a room full of people, like, is selling Agile difficult? How you do it? Everybody was saying, like, well, it used to be difficult, like, five years ago or even ten years ago. These days, it's, it's really not all that difficult. It's just the problem of, like, yeah, they would love to do Agile, but they really don't understand it. They don't understand the benefits, and they don't understand what it actually requires. That's why I'm going to start by talking just a bit about this topic, because I personally run into this all the time. We do quite a bit of Agile training and Agile coaching, and we do see the issue of like people really, really don't understand what it means. So to set the, set the uh, basic scene on this, first of all, Agile is not about software at all. You happen to do software with Agile, but the real change in Agile is not about software as such. It's not implementation of sprints or, or time and materials. It's, it's really none of these. It's, it's really a different way of approaching how do we do cooperation between organizations and how do, how do we do product development as such. So that's the first misconception. If you consider your projects, like web projects, if you consider they are only like IT projects and nothing else, eh, fine. You, you really can't, can't go all that agile because agile means quite heavy business involvement in any sort of project. So the business owner who owns the project, they have to be involved. If they're not, you can forget about it. So uh, what we say always is agile is simple, but it's not easy. So any organization starting to adapt Agile, you can do it. You can learn it in, in, in a couple of days quite easily. Adopting it really and using it, that takes years, years of practice. So you're sort of like getting the hang of it after a year or two, and, and then you really start seeing more and more benefits when you, when you start adopting it. And to make the situation a bit more difficult, we as vendors, we are working with customers who don't understand Agile. So another half of your Agile-like entity changes all the time when, when your customers are different. So let's look at the basics. I think who, who of you has not seen this ever? I should have asked the other way around who has seen it and, you know, but oh well. Um, so this is the, the manifesto for Agile software development, which all of we know and love and all that. And you know, it sounds great, doesn't it? And then there's the but. And, and the real core of the problem is actually here. This is what happens. It's, it's not uh, proper Agile. It's, it's the half-assed version of Agile. So basically, um, to give you an example from here, we, uh, we of course, uh, it's better to have customer collaboration than, than contract negotiation, as long as you have strict contracts in place. So, so you sort of get all of these comments from the customers often say like, yeah, sure, we can do sprints, but it has to be fixed everything. We have to have a fixed scope, and we have to be very strict on what to do. So uh, they kind of adopt Agile, but they really don't because they break it in process by doing a half-assed job on doing it. And this is, this is what I see very, very often with the customers. They kind of love it, but not really. So this is what, what I call fake Agile. 
And, and to get a bit more examples on this, again, I'm, I'm asking a bit of your, your participation, first of all. So to get the rest of the session more fitting to, to your questions, what's stopping you from selling Agile today? Why don't, you know, first of all, why are you here? Because if you are selling all Agile and you have, don't have any problems, I don't think you would be here. So if you can help me out a bit and let me know, like, what's stopping you from selling Agile today, feel free to tweet it, and we'll get back to these questions uh, fairly soon. And we'll also do a very nice pie chart on, like, what are the biggest problems. So please help me out a bit. So uh, I want to bring in another angle to this topic. Uh, so I'm going to ask Dick to, to help us a bit on, like, from your point of view, what's stopping us from doing Agile? It's, it is a difficult question. Um, I think uh, you're touching on many good points here. Um, it's people, they think that they know Agile, um, uh, but it, they have difficulty seeing the benefits of it. Uh, and that's really because many people, they sell Agile the wrong way to companies like Pfizer. Um, I am in touch with a lot of vendors that approach us and they sell Agile the wrong way. They, they don't lift up the benefits of Agile. They say, we do sprints, we do, we're standing up when we have our meetings and it, instead of sitting down and <laughs> these kind of things. They don't sell the benefits. They don't sell um, the benefits of doing product development with Agile, um, you know how you can how you can test and measure your progress and continuously improve and these kind of things. It, it's not about sprints, uh, as you touched on, and it's not about standing up instead of sitting down. Um, uh, so it, really, selling it the wrong way. That's you edu educating organizations like Pfizer the wrong way. It's I think that's the simple answer to to quite a complex question, really. Yeah, and I, I, I think that's, that's exactly what it is about. And uh, let's have another view that I, I think probably is going to reinforce this. You need to be really quiet for, for in order to hear this, but I hope you can be. Oh, did anyone hear the previous video? Still? Okay, fine. So let's, let's try if this one works. Uh, I think the single biggest problem is uh, related to decision-making structure of large organizations. So they have pretty slow decision-making processes and they are not used to having these projects which do constant demands to other, uh, orga to other parts of the organization. And that's the biggest single problem, the current uh, leadership style or decision-making progress process in large organizations. So basically, basically the way they run their business, which is not very agile, um, and again, this we see as a vendor over and over again, everything has to be pre-approved, which makes it pretty difficult to be really agile. Uh, so let's move on to some real life examples and case studies on, on this. Uh, so the first one, sure we can do that agile, as long as you deliver the entire scope and, and everything within the budget and timeline and nothing changes. How many times have you seen it? Who, who's seen this in an in a RFP? There are some people who haven't. I'm surprised. So, so uh, this is this is the typical argument you get, and and this happens really quite often. Um, so, how to deal with it? Uh, first of all, in order to sell any of these, you should have a bit of like storytelling skills. So, ideally, you should try to know something about the customer business, and and you should tell tell them a story they can relate to. Like, why did you fail on a previous project? You don't have to know the facts. It's quite easy to guess based on the RFPs often. It's like, well, let's imagine you have this kind of a project in your business and, and then you do this and you know what happens and, and then the end result is kind of poor, isn't it? And then you have them like, yeah, 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 that's just what happened. That's what happened the previous time. So that's sort of the foundation for it. Make stories out of this stuff. Try to, try to tell stories that are like specific for the customer and their business. And, and don't make them about your business if you can. I know it's sometimes difficult. If, if, like, if the customer is a company, let's say they're doing like cat food, maybe it's slightly difficult to, to think about like, you know, what's, what's important for them and what's their process like. Uh, so that's the first point. Uh, second thing is like, approach it with some facts. 
have a look at like why is so, what's beneficial, and so on. So for example, in fixed bit or, or agile, you can have a look at like different different things that are, are very different in these. And and I, I did this for a, for a real customer some time ago uh, because they were just like, why should we do this agile thing? Isn't it only time and materials and so on? Like, mm, no, not really. Let let me you know get through all the points. It's like what's really different in this. So there's a couple of things here. A project focus, of course. Uh, the biggest problem with fixed bid, the, the short term I used for fixed everything, so it's not only fixed price, it's fixed everything, um, is, is like, uh, it's all about checking boxes, really. So you have a number of requirements for your project, and those boxes need to be checked. And who cares about the quality or anything? The vendor is motivated in trying to check all the boxes with minimum amount of effort because you make more profit. The faster you are, more profit you make, basically. So the incentives for the vendor are not very healthy. And, and it's quite different from, from when you're doing Agile, because in a good way, Agile is time and materials. So as a customer, you are paying for results. And, and great quality can be one of them. And the vendor is not incentivized in actually cutting quality or trying to cut corners in, in just going somewhere. So it, it's very different. Change is pretty evident, what happens there. Uh, and, and scope in Agile is actually improved. It's not that it's only a different scope, it's actually an improved scope, because you learn during a project. So the final scope ends up being better than the original one you started with. Some more stuff. Uh, transparency is one of the key reasons why Agile is so popular. You actually, its projects do become really transparent when, when you are doing Agile. And uh, in, in fixed bit, if you're doing a waterfall process, what happens is this thing is like 95% complete, but nobody knows what the remaining 5% takes. And, and that's, that's the, the traditional problem you have. Whereas in Agile, you, you have a real like tangible progress where stuff that is actually ready to be, be deployed is, is delivered all the time. So it's much easier to track. Time to market is kind of self-evident because if you do all of the design first before you start implementing anything, it is going to be slower that way than delivering the highest value items first and starting from there. Uh, quality, I think I touched on that already, so I'm just going to move forward. Uh, <clears throat> customer involvement also is very different uh, profile-wise because you couldn't really do an agile project where the customer is on vacation all the time. So in a in, in more traditional way, it's like a big push to do like a big piece of documentation and, and then, you know, it's easier. In Agile, it's more like distributed all over the project. Which one do you prefer? I don't know. Uh, you get better results anyway with the, with the Agile approach in this case. Um, risks are a bit different and, and pricing. Uh, pricing is an interesting thing because fixed bit is anything but fixed. Because uh, you, you have this, and this is a real picture. So if you can't, uh, can't read them, the small boat is original, uh, original uh, contract, and the bigger yacht is change order. And, and this, I think this is from uh, some person from construction industry that, that actually owns the boats. Uh, but this is true for the IT industry as well. The, the IT vendors are highly motivated on getting change orders, and, and their business depends on getting as many change orders as possible because the profit margin is way higher on change orders than in the original contract. And this is in your traditional contract. So, so really the fixed bit, it's, it's anything but in real life. It's, it's just a good way for vendors to lie to the customer and say like, yeah, we'll do it for this money. And in the end, everything ends up being a, a uh, change request. So, you know, on the other hand, as a vendor, if, if, if you want to get a bigger boat, you may want to consider doing fixed bid and just being evil. Uh, that, that may work as well. Um, uh, so basically, the difference being here, what are the benefits? You create a fast value faster, so you can see, see the highest value items coming out of it soon, uh, and you have higher quality by default, because cutting quality is no longer beneficial for the vendor. In, in agile process. So you will, by default, you will get higher quality. And in the end, the customer usually saves money as well. I'll, I'll get back to that, that topic a bit on, on uh, later, like why that is. 
Another case, we have no product owner. Uh, I'm kind of assuming all of you know, know basics on Agile process, so I'm not going to explain any of these terms. Uh, you may have to Google them <laughs> if you don't. Uh, so uh, this, this is typical for some companies. Well, we, we delivered all of the like, layouts for you already, and, and we delivered like, this like, brick of paper. Isn't that enough to, to just implement it? Just you know, go and implement. Um, that may or may not work. Uh, but one of the core things how we work with customers is it looks like this. So, so basically the customer uh, has their business competence. And, and they can, of course, you know, they're experts in their own business. We have uh, competence on how to do great projects that are on track and reach their goals and so on. We can help them in that. We also have a lot of like digital competence. We, we have this funny tool that is like true something that we use quite a bit. And, and we do know, know a lot about how to do like digital services. When you combine all of these skills, we really like to believe that the end result is much better than just the sum of its parts. So basically, when, when we can give feedback for the product owner during the project on how could you do this and are there different ways of doing it and so on, uh, the end result is, 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 is usually better. Uh, we don't, if we just do it based on a paper, we don't really know what's, what's the thinking behind of all, all, of, all of the specifications the customer did. Uh, we can ask the product owner, we can propose better solutions and so on. So um, that's, uh, that's the first part of this. So sort of having like one team with shared goals, it's probably, probably a good idea for most projects. So sort of like leaving your badges when you go in, just leave your badges on the table and forget about who works for which company. Just create a team that works together for, for a shared goal. Um, the second thing, this would be your, your uh, traditional uh, project where uh, you do, of course, planning first and so on and so on. Uh, this would be your agile project. So in theory, exactly the same amount of planning is still there. We don't really save on, on doing less planning or anything like that. It's just done in, in different places of a project. And it's, most of the planning is actually done with quite a bit more information about the project topic, it's, uh, topic itself. Um, this becomes really useful if this, if this happens. And this may be you running out of time, you running out of budget, whatever have you. I don't know if this ever has happened to somebody that you run out of time or, or budget in a project. But if it would, if it happens at this point, in an agile project, we've delivered the most valuable bits already. So more than half of the project is ready to be actually launched or maybe already launched at this point. Well, the lower value stuff is not done. It started, but it's not done. Not a very nice place to be, but it may not be a disaster. In a traditional project, we haven't delivered anything. We have some code. We don't know if it works. It hasn't been tested and, and it's not ready to be deployed. And it hasn't been at this point. So, so this makes a very, very big difference between like traditional and agile approach. Again, these are some of the, the tools you hopefully can use to, to convince the customer that this is a good idea. So basically, we lower the risk quite a bit. What if we are late? Much less of an impact with agile. Uh, it generates new ideas. You only have one team of people working closely together during the entire project. So they will come up with new ideas. Um, because, for example, our people, of course, they move from project to project and customer to customer, so they see multiple industries. So they will have new, fresh ideas quite often. And in the end, it's, it's saving money. You, if, let's say if, if you haven't designed something and you, you decide that, well, I, I'm not going to implement it, you're not going to have any cost of, from it. But, but if, if you already designed it, you have a sunken cost for, for the design bit. You're just not going to implement it. So, before we move to uh, case three, Heike, do we have any, any questions? Well, uh, one about, uh, um, do you think a mix of Agile and Waterfall is a good route to take? <laughs> oh, <laughs> I, I wouldn't go there. Uh, the reason being, Agile is a big shift in, in a mindset. And, and if, if your teams are working like in a traditional mindset where all the work is pushed to the team. So you have a product manager assigning tasks all the time and you are pushing the work to the people and on the other day they are supposed to pull the work. So 
So they are supposed to take responsibility, they are supposed to take ownership of the work. It's a very difficult thing to mix between these two mindsets. They are quite different. So on all levels, the actual the mindset difference is the key. So I, I wouldn't, wouldn't actually uh, mix both of these. Any experience on mixing, mixing these from the, your organization? Because I know you've been moving. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I, I would I would agree. Um, a mix is rarely a very good idea. Um, you, you you can't really take the big benefits from agile if you try to mix it with with, with something like waterfall. Um, at, at Pfizer, one of the uh, sort of eye openers when I've been trying to push agile within the organization is this: ah, it's actually working like we develop drugs. We, we come up with an idea, you know, we, we build it, we test it, we measure it, and then we learn from it. You know, it makes sense to build websites or web projects the same way. That was a little bit of an eye-opener, this learning and the iteration of it. Uh, you can't really uh, develop drugs in, in a waterfall way, and, and mixing the two to trying, then you will just miss the point, really. It's, uh, yeah. Any other questions at this point? Or? Well, we have a new one. Um, how do you manage projects with a large set of critical must-have functionality? Oh, <laughs> um, this, it's, this, this is a deep uh, rabbit hole. Um, the must-haves, the question is, are they really must-haves? If you're using like uh, Moscow prioritization, like must-have, should have, could have, won't, whatever, ho however you want to use it, uh, the must-haves, uh, should be something that you absolutely cannot launch the product without. So, so if that thing doesn't exist, you, you don't get any value out of the project. Could have should be something that it's really going to hurt, but you can still launch it with could haves and so on. So it depends on your definition of must haves. Uh, but it, it's, it's a fairly large topic area, but basically I would just be really strict on what is a must have. When you're migrating from an old platform, they say yeah, you, have, you must have all the features of the old platform. Yeah, so the, the um, comment was it, it could be when you're migrating from one platform to another. Yes, if you want to do a lift and shift project, but if you want to improve it a bit, uh, and perhaps on an old site, not everything is actually absolutely needed to launch the new site. Like, say, full content migration, if you have 10 million pieces of content, and some of them don't get any traffic every month. But, yeah. All right, okay, uh, so moving on. Let's have a look at the feedback a bit. This is, this is also quite often the case that the actual testing and acceptance and everything is at the end of the project only, and there's limited testing and discussion and, and you know, uh, test users and everything during the project. So this is what it looks like. Um, basically, basically, you have a goal in the middle, and, and then you have a timeline, and, and the top line being a, a waterfall project where all the testing and all of the real feedback comes from the end. So basically we do, do some sort of internal launch or whatever launch at the end. Uh, we may actually end up getting a bit different product that we were aiming for, but we don't really know it before it meets the real life or meets the internal stakeholders or whatever. Uh, whereas in Agile, we do multiple deliveries. So we actually get the internal stakeholders, we can get like uh, beta testers or whatever you may have, really early working on parts of the product, and you get the feedback earlier. You are still going to be off. You are still not going to do a perfect product on a first try, but you know it much earlier. So you get really, really quick feedback. So, you know, testing everything and getting pilot users and so on, that's very important, and you can only do it if you have something for them to use. Makes sense? Um, another... Uh, this is one of my fi favorite examples, actually. Uh, let's imagine for a while um, the, the product we are trying to do is like a lottery with three numbers. And, and we can play the lottery in a way that we pay a three euro lottery ticket. And, you know, then we see if we win or not. That's the first way of doing it. So our average investment for the lottery ticket is always three euros, right? And, and that's, that's always the same. And the possibility of winning is, is 
naturally always the same. The second way of pay, playing the same game is you invest one euro for one number and, and you only need to commit to buying the second number after you know if the first number is a winning number or not. Then you do the same thing for the second number and then for the third number. Well, I don't think anyone would use the three euro ticket at this point. But yet the projects are done, done this way in companies because on, on average your investment uh, for, for the second case, for successful case, is going to be like uh, 1.11 euros. And, and for the first case, for successful lottery ticket, it's going to be 3 euros. And this is based on like real options theory. So if you want to learn about the science behind all of this, you, you can actually uh, refer to the science and not just your gut feeling. Just Google real options and, and that's, that's what's behind it. It is kind of common sense. But companies, they don't usually think like this. It's like, no, no, I need to have this fixed bit where everything is in instead of let's do a smaller bit first and see if it works. If it doesn't, it's a sunken cost and we'll, we'll just forget it. If it doesn't, let's build on top of it and let's do, do more stuff. So making them understand that doing one big investment on one go may not be the best idea. Maybe, maybe eye-opening for, for some customers. So uh, we get higher quality this way, we get faster learning, we save money again. So the benefits are definitely there. So just remember to get always back to the why, is it good for you, what are the benefits? One of my favorites, Photoshop. I, I just read a tweet about like, uh, Photoshop is the best way to show your customer what your site is never gonna look like. <laughs> Something along these lines. Uh, I, I think that's, that was a perfect quote. Uh, so basically, if you do design first, we are dealing with Drupal here. Drupal has existing functionality, it has existing user interfaces, yet many people just, you know, you have your Photoshop cowboys and they just go and do something and then it gets approved and you're supposed to implement it as is. Well, the fact is, this is any project. Uh, you have knowledge going up and, and you have time going, uh, going horizontally. So in start of any project, the team doing the project has minimum amount of knowledge they will ever have on that topic. At the end of the project, they have maximum knowledge on this, this specific project, right? This is why hindsight is such a beautiful thing. It's so easy to be smart at the end of any project when you know you already wrapped up everything and then you know. Uh, so when do we do all of the important decisions in a project? Minimum available information, right? So we fixed everything before we know what the project is going to be all about. And, and in a real project, if, if we deliver frequently during the project, we would learn all the time and the team would learn more and more of the project. So actually, we would do better decisions because we know more. So of course, we can't make all of the decisions at the end of the project because, you know, it's kind of done at that point. Uh, but what we can do is we can do all of the decisions at the latest responsible moment. So, you know, sometimes not doing decision is much worse than, than doing a bad one. So at, at some point you have to decide. But we can postpone them, learn more first. So that we can't do if, if it's a, a uh, fixed everything bit. So how do we approach this? Uh, this is loosely the, the uh, process model we use at Wundercrowd. So basically what we do is uh, Drupal is a very good prototyping tool. It's like, I like to say that with Drupal features are cheap and details are expensive. Uh, you can build a fairly complicated site like within days, functionality wise, and then it's gonna look horrible, but it still works. And, and you know, with Drupal you, you start the project with the fully functional product and you spend most of your time breaking the product. That's, that's the way Drupal projects go. Uh, so, what we do is we, we uh, have options on implementing something for, for the product owner. Like there's the quick and dirty way. I can do this in 15 minutes. And, and you know, it's sort of gonna be what you wanted, but not exactly. Then you have the perfect way. This is exactly like you envisioned, but it's gonna take us three weeks to do. And you may have something in between as well. And all of these being te different technical implementation options. So uh, then what happens is the product owner is the one who will make the decision which one of these we should do. Because if, if one of them would be like visually brilliant or one of them would be technically just like 
fantastic to implement. It's so much fun for the developers. Uh, the downside of this is that, like the money is not, it, you know, it's not the developers or designers' money. It's the customers' money. So we actually make it visible for the customer. Like, look, do you want to make it perfect and spend a lot of money? Or do you want to do a quick and dirty hack and, and do it very cheaply? And depending on a case, they, they will pick either one. Quite often they go with the quick and dirty because they are, well, this is not so important thing. Let's just do it the cheap way first and then see what happens. But if it's like a, the core feature of the entire site or whatever, they are more likely to go with the expensive way. The, the case be, being here, having options and, and getting the customer to decide because they, they own the budget. In fixed everything, they wouldn't. You would just go with the like minimum whatever works solution. Or you may have to go with the expensive way because that's the way somebody drew it in Photoshop. And, and you know, you, you can't do anything about it. And it's stupid for the customer to spend so much money on something just to make it pixel perfect instead of going with, well, well this is actually almost good enough and it's way cheaper to do. So, uh, there, there's a principle behind this. Again, there's some kind of science. I think this is economics. I don't know if it's a science or not. Uh, but uh, it, it, the Pareto principle, which has nothing to do with software. So it says 80% of the results are often, you know, you get it for 20% effort. So the initial bits you do are very valuable if you start from the highest value items, and then the value goes slowly, slowly up. So it's just a question of at which point do we want to stop working. At 20% maybe not good enough. 30 40%? Maybe it's good enough. And quite often, this I think in Drupal, this may be even like 95, 5% uh, principle sometimes. Because the last, last stuff you do with the details, it's something like, well, our marketing manager did spot a one small mistake there. Can we please fix it? Nobody else ever in the world would have noticed, and you spent like two days fixing it. May not be the best, best uh, solution cost-wise. Cost so... We end up with improved product, much lower risk if, if you approach it like this, and again, new ideas. Last case, unfair relationships. So basically, uh, let's do another show of hands. How many RFPs have you seen where the contract terms are completely unreasonable? Oh, if you have, yeah, okay. So um, this this is what, what it looks like. Uh, it's This is especially with large organizations, this has to do with procurement departments. Uh, and, and procurement departments often, they like playing a game called win-lose. So they think in a, in a good relationship, one party wins and one loses. So they try to squeeze like as much of, of, of choose out of the vendor as they can, basically. They try to negotiate the prices, they try to negotiate warranties, they try to push you as hard as they can. And, and that's not really a healthy thing because that's not a, a stable, uh, like sustainable relationship. Because in, a, in a, any good healthy relationship, both parties have to be happy. Uh, and if, if it's a win-lose game, that's, that's never going to happen. So what you should do instead is like you can do different pricing and contract models. For example, in Agile, you could do, say, this one, which is target price. Uh, and if you, know, if, if you manage to be under the target price, you get 20% of the remaining amount for free as a bonus. So you get money for free. Customer saved money and you get money for not working. Pretty sweet. If you go over some defined uh, target or some defined maximum price, uh, then you actually work for like say minus 40% discount, which is really gonna hurt you. But the customer is still paying for you to work because it shouldn't be for free for them either because it's like both parties have failed in this way. So figuring out ways where you can share risk and share penalties and have like more stable relationship between the parties. Uh, some of these are easy to sell to the customer because it's like, hey, look, you know, you, you'll save money if, if we are faster. And, you know, if, if, we are, if we are way over the maximum price, we will share your pain. It's, it's going to help your sales as well. There's a bit of stuff, but uh, we don't really have time to go into detail, but it's worth Googling the Terminal 5 contract model may sound funny, but the software industry may have something to learn from construction industry at times. Um, uh, this is Heatro Terminal 5, uh, and they, they uh, built it, and it was a massive success because they had a completely different contract models in place, and yeah, just go online, there's plenty of material, read it. It's, it's well worth uh, spending a bit of time on that. 
So again, quite a new, uh, quite a nice uh, benefits uh, potentially out of this. So um, I have another uh, guest speaker here. I would have used more of more of uh, James's uh, stuff. So he's James uh, Katz. He's a director for product implementation. Product implementation being American for building websites in this case, um, and and he works for NBC Universal. He's, he's basically he brought them from waterfall to agile, like the entire organization, and he does it for a living. Unfortunately, I had to do this only over Skype, so the quality was so bad I couldn't use more of his stuff. But let's see what he he says about. Uh, what do you ask when, when looking for um, an Agile vendor? So if you want to sell Agile, what should you do? I think the volume is hopefully a bit higher on this one. Sure, yeah. I, I think, um, well, I don't have a real list that I go through, but what I try to do is really get the vendor to share what their experience is. And I find any vendor who is using some form of Agile has that experience. They're, they're very passionate about it. Um, and willing to share, and they usually have some some type of presentation that they're sort of really excited to share. Uh, so, you know, that's one of the first things I do is just get them to to share. Ask them, you know, what is your experience with Agile? Tell me about your processes. Give me examples. How have you done this? And usually, organization or vendors that are that are um, have experience with Agile that are, are good are passionate and they're really willing to share um, that information. Uh, it's, you know, when that conversation is quiet, the response is quiet and it becomes uncomfortable, then you, then you know that that vendor probably doesn't have, you know, um, the best experience there. But I find, you know, when you're, when you're interviewing vendors and, and talking to them, those that have the experience are usually pretty excited to share it when you ask. So, um, you know, I always say just ask. Yep. So be excited about your own stuff. Uh, I did ask the same question from, from uh, Pertu as well, and he has a different point of view on this a bit. I think for me, uh, the biggest problem, what we see more, most often when we evaluate agencies is that there are a lot of agencies uh, who just say that uh, we are happy to adapt to any style what the customer wants to do. Uh, and then there we have a lot of, we already start already have started to have these agencies which have a lot of experience from Agile already and many of them have already developed uh, their own way of doing Agile and uh, that's what we like to hear and we like to listen to them and hear their experiences why they have chosen this certain style of doing Agile whether it's internally or whether it's with the clients or always um, I think finding Finding your own way with Agile, that's one thing what we look for when we evaluate agencies and we highly value those agencies that have found their own way of doing Agile and are really promoting that way and saying to the client that this is how we work. And that's really important. So, find your own way, stick to it, don't do whatever customer asks and I think that's a very valid uh, advice because if you do whatever process the customer asks, first of all, the customer is sort of silly to do it because they are trying to tell somebody what tools to use. Why don't they hire somebody who actually meets their process instead? So it, it, it makes no sense for, for anybody really to do it. Um, and uh, I can add some perspective to this as well. Um, uh, sitting in the engineering department at Pfizer, I often evaluate vendors that build websites for us from, from a technical point of view. Um, and what I like to do is, is looking at their processes and their tools that they have in place uh, to make sure that the vendor uh, have a process in place and have tools and continuing, continuous integration tools in place to actually release code, our code, frequently. That's paramount. I found that paramount to learn and measure the success. Uh, many vendors, they come to us and say, yeah, we do sprints, but then we don't learn anything. We don't try. We don't measure our results along the way. Having tools in place to release your code continuously after every sprint or, or what it be is, is of paramount from a, from a technical point of view. So looking at vendors, making sure that they have those tools in place and have the practices in place to support that 
is of paramount because otherwise we, we lose the whole learning process, which is so important. Great. Let's have a look at the, the results a bit uh, from, from the questions. So basically, I'm going to start with the other diagram. So this is how the room looks like. So how large percentage of your projects are agile? Um, it's like a surprising, actually. Uh, I, was, I was expecting more like companies who do exclusively agile and not so much. But most, most people seem to be in the middle. Right. OK, this is, this is going to be an interesting uh, thing to analyze afterwards. So what about the issues, uh, what we have in the room today? So demanding fixed everything, yes. Not big enough projects, fair enough. I'll cover that as well. Uh, not understanding agile. That's actually surprisingly large percentage. Um, and customers not willing to engage. Eh. All other agencies offer fixed prices. Um, we have quite a few triple agencies in the room. Can we please stop doing that, <laughs> like tomorrow? <laughs> I'm not trying to do price fixing or anything. I'm trying to get rid of this like uh, waterfall nonsense. Um, uh, yeah, yeah, I know it's been recorded. That's why I said I'm not doing any price fixing. <laughs> Um, you want to do the opposite of price fixing. Yeah, exactly. The opposite no of price. price. Yeah. No fixed price, indeed. All right. A um, couple more things before, before we move into the uh, questions. So uh, what about when should you sell Agile? Uh, I think the most important uh, question was already up there. So really, what's the size of a project? And this, this may be bad news for, for any small shops in here where, where your average project size is tiny. Um, Agile doesn't work well on very small projects. You can use some aspects of Agile. You can perfectly well use something like Kanban in, in small stuff as well. Uh, but if you look at like anything that has to do with iterations and sprints, you may notice one thing if you look at Scrum, for example. One iteration in Scrum is a waterfall. I'm sorry to break it to you, but it, it, that's the case. So if it's small enough, it doesn't have any room to actually start working as it's intended. So don't try to force Scrum, for example, on projects of all sizes. You need to have big enough project. It's, Scrum is designed for like seven-ish people team, all of them being developers, and, and a project that runs for a year or more. We have plenty of these projects for Drupal, but I know the biggest part of Drupal projects are not like this. They are way smaller. So, so that's where, where we get to this. So tiny, I, I'm using man days here instead of money because I know money varies quite a bit from market to market. So if, for example, we are doing a project in Latvia or in the UK, the day rate is slightly different. Uh, so <laughs> that's why I'm using man days. So tiny projects in my books are like 30 days or less, man days uh, or woman days, whatever you, you want to have. Uh, and and that, that would be like waterfall thing anyway. It's fixed everything because you have to design it first and then do it. It's a tiny, tiny thing, and just get it over with. Um, small sites, uh, let's say less than 100 days. Kanban works nicely. Scrum ban, adopt some of the traits of, of Scrum into Kanban. That may work as well. Uh, then medium to large sites, Scrum ban, or, or even simplified Scrum, uh, trying to keep the overhead minimum, like if it's, if it's less than 300 man days. And then the sweet spot of Scrum being with Drupal, being like 300 to, to 1,500 a man days. Uh, this is Drupal specific, uh, in, in my opinion. And if it's bigger than that, I would split it into multiple teams. You get better results with, with multiple teams in, in that point. Otherwise, it's going to take forever for one Drupal team to get through it because they are stepping on each other's toes all the time and, and getting in a way. So split it, just get on with it. Um, so couple of requirements for, for selling Agile. You need, to, you need to see and know the benefits. You need to know the process. And, and you need to have experience in it. It's a chicken and egg problem, of course. If you want to move to Agile, but you don't have the experience, how do you sell it? And that's where I recommend try getting a customer that already trusts you and knows you and start with them. And agree with some sort of terms like, look, you know, we are practicing and we are sharing the risk and you'll get big discounts and whatever. We just want to get started with this because we know it's good for us and it would be good for you as well. So doing something like that, even internal projects, but that's a bit different dynamic. Um, and 
the key thing here is like your sales force has to sales force has to be quite integrated in in all of your operations, because if they have no idea what agile and all of this is about, there's no way they can sell it. Absolutely no way. As as you as you heard from all of the the people I had in this this thing, everybody was saying like, look, if you're not convincing, if you don't know your stuff, you will not be able to sell it. Right. So uh, last. But not least, uh, before we move to questions, uh, so how do you deal with it when when you get a fixed everything RFP? Uh, first of all, a fixed budget is not the problem. That's fine. I actually like having a fixed budget because fixed budget forces priorities. You need to set your priorities. You have to move stuff out of the project. You have to get like the least important stuff and forget about it. And that's healthy for any project. There's always some extra stuff that shouldn't ever be done in any project. So it's a good thing. Fixed schedule, you can also have that. If you have a deadline on when to publish, fine. Completely fine. But fixed scope, never. And, and even, if, like, even if your budget and, and your, uh, your uh, timeline is, is flexible, fixed scope is not a good idea. Why? Because you lose most of the benefits I was talking about. You can definitely do it, and you can use Scrum to deliver a product with fixed, uh, like everything else, and and you know, the scope, scope, everything else being flexible and the scope being fixed. But you don't get most of the benefits of Agile at that point. So yeah, go ahead. You can do it, and you probably succeed because you have like infinite resources. So you know, you became a government right now. <laughs> uh, but uh, other than that, it's it's not a good idea. So how to deal with this is like we do three different things in when, when we see it. Uh, sometimes we just decline. Say like, oh, no, sorry, not interested. Uh, this is mostly mostly if the customer wouldn't fit our profile anyway, and we just send our apologies and say like, yeah, look, sorry, we are not going to take part in this. Mostly we take the, the uh, middle one. We decline, we explain why. We tell the customer, look, we are not going to propose for, for your project because it's going to fail. And we explain why it's going to fail. And it's specific for the project. So it, it, it's a bit of effort. It takes like some hours to, to actually explain it like, because you're doing this and this. And, and it's for these reasons, it's not going to work. And this is what we would recommend you do instead. And, and you know, no hard feelings. And that's it. Uh, it costs a bit of time. Customer may learn something. Uh, for example, I've. I mostly work with our UK office because I, I'm, I'm based in London, uh, helping Steve and my other colleagues there. Uh, and most of our UK projects last year, or within the last 12 months, uh, we've actually won by declining, <laughs> funnily enough. So we say no. And, and for example, one of these like, large media companies, we, we told them, like, no, we're not going to do this because you know, it, that's not going to work. The response was like, congratulations, you have been shortlisted. It happens. But you really need to justify them, why it's not a good idea. And if all of the vendors would do this, that would be beneficial. And that's one of my own motivations on actually talking about the topic. I hope more vendors would do this, because then we would fix this like really broken way of, of procuring IT, IT projects. Well, then the last solution being, and this is what many companies do, they still do a proposal. And, and they just say like, yeah, yeah, it's, you know, we can make it agile later and we have time and they will see the light and then, you know, just fingers crossed. <laughs> and, and you can sometimes do this, but it's a very high risk thing uh, because the customer doesn't really understand agile. And, and yeah, I, I, I would really advise caution if, if you choose this one. You can do it sometimes, but be aware it is going to fail from time to time. Uh, and it can be really expensive when it fails. Uh, so as long as you're very aware of that, that's, that's fine. So basically, now we should have some more, more questions and some time for that. Do we have any Twitter questions? Yeah. Uh, first one, um, what if a customer doesn't have the resources or skills required for good product ownership? Well, then you train the customer, first of all. You provide training. A uh, big, big part of our business, uh, not volume-wise, uh, but meaning meaningfulness wise <laughs> is uh, is providing agile training and coaching just because we couldn't do our projects without it so you support your customer on it first of all 
If they don't have enough time to do it, then you provide them with a product owner body, somebody who's like an experienced consultant who understands the customer's business and can actually help them in setting the priorities and, and creating a great product. So this person is not going to be a product owner. It's going to be a body or whatever you want to call it. Uh, it's just going to help, help the product owner and make the job of the product owner so much easier. So that, that's the approach I would take. Then we have a couple of questions, maybe generally from sales or uh, agile methodology, but uh, do you want to take them? Yeah, sure. They can fit in, fit in here. Uh, how do you sell work that is not immediately visible or p beneficial to the client, e.g. refactoring or API modules? Oh, uh, <laughs> hidden work. It's always interesting. Uh, you have to make a business case for it. So if you need to do refactoring, why? You need to explain me why if I'm the customer. Uh, you have to tell me like, okay, this is going to reduce your maintenance cost later by this and this much. Uh, but you need to have a business reason for all of this. If you need to do an API thing, let's say you are building an e-commerce site and you need to do uh, spend two sprints doing integration to, to logistics, well, if I don't do this, your packets will not be delivered. Uh, so just always start with the why. Start with the benefit. What do they get from it? And also when your devs come back to you and say, look, we have to refactor the entire thing, why? And, and if, if there's no reason, if they can't explain it, perhaps it's you know, not worth refactoring it sometimes. So you, know, you have to justify the money spent. How do you estimate the budget of the projects when selling Agile? Officially or, or uh, like for real? <laughs> um, officially what you do is, is you, you uh, take a book like Agile Estimation and, and go through like all the functionality and and uh, it's a very long, long process. Uh, unofficially, for most projects that are like uh, six figures, you, you know, you, you use the Stetson thing and, and, and you just, based on your experience, you come up with like, well, that's what it's likely to be. Uh, and, and since the scope is flexible and you know what their business goals are, it's quite accurate to say like, look, this is going to be 400,000 pounds and uh, you know that you can deliver these benefits for that money. You are uncertain what the exact scope will be, but that's fine because the scope is not fixed. So, so frankly, if, when you have experienced enough people on board and a couple of them like do the same sort of estimates and they end up on roughly on same number, it's going to be the same one. So I had my, my team in one, one large project doing like, they were like, they, they want to do proper estimates for this. And I'm like, well, I'm just going to put a number here and you do your job and have a look at the number after you are done. I ended up at 960,000. They ended up at 940,000. And they spent two days. I spent two minutes. So, so it, it, you know, if you don't have the experience behind you, it may be difficult. And then you have to do the difficult way and do proper estimates for everything. But after you've seen it like 25 times, similar kind of case, same kind of a customer, frankly, I quite often just do educated guesses. Anything else? Uh, the last one at the moment is, how do you determine the amount of hours per sprint and the number of sprints? Um, it depends on your team size. So if, if, if the team is bigger, basically the basic formula there is like, the bigger the theme, the less productive it will be per hour spent because you are doing, spending more time on communications. So ideally you would use as small team as possible because then your productivity is higher. And this is especially true with Drupal where, you know, stepping on others' toes and all that stuff. Um, so just first of all, look at how small team you can get away with and, and then do your math like, okay, we need... Uh, if our sprint is two weeks and, and we have this many days on a sprint and this is our budget, and then you just estimate it. But you can, it can vary quite a bit because, for example, we use like one week sprints and two week sprints, um, and, and both of them work just fine. Uh, it's just a different kind of project where we use them at. And, and usually the team is fixed for the entire project. So Agile actually, from the vendor point of view, it's going to also make your resourcing quite a bit easier even though I don't like the word resource, but still your resourcing is going to be easier because people are going to be in a project for like months and they are full-time there and nothing else. So our resourcing spreadsheet is really like 
one uh, like Google spreadsheet where we have only weeks and people and nothing else. And we don't need a resourcing manager for, for to, man to actually run that. That's very simple. So I don't know if that answered the question at all, but I hope. Are there any other? We have like 20 seconds left. One last question. We have time for it, and then we're done. Shoot. Can you please walk to the microphone so the recording actually captures it as well? How should the contractuals be done? Like, uh, is it like per sprint, and then the client is not happy, and then he can cut the contract? Or it's like, you know, 10 sprints, take it or leave it? Ideally, uh, what, what I would do is like uh, let, let the customer terminate the contract at any point for like any reason. So they commit only for one sprint. But you can also do what I showed earlier, where if you are ready early for one, re one reason or another, the customer pays you a bonus, and then, you know, you walk away. Uh, we, we typically have very, very flexible contract terms because it's based on trust. And we tell the customer up front, we expect a bit of notification if you're going to terminate the project because, you know, we need to sell the team to somewhere else. Uh, so I, I would be really flexible on contract terms. So we are out of time. Um, I, I thank you all for, for your time and I hope it's useful. <laughs>